Hello, everyone. I hope that you are doing well. I am very pleased and excited to welcome our guest, Mr. Danish Mehraj, to our show today. Many of you are familiar with his name as he is the editor of Brassi's monthly newsletter. His articles and essays appear regularly in our newsletters and are liked very much as is evident from the feedback that we receive on a, on a regular basis. So today we have the opportunity to hear from Danish in person. Danish holds double degrees in med tech and med tech quality. Uh, he is the principal engineer for medical device design at Resica BV in Germany. Some of Danish's accomplishments are shown here on this slide. So here we are uh, having a chat with our colleague uh, Danish Meraj, uh, a well-known expert and uh, professional in his field. He has so much to share with us and we look forward to sharing his insights on these topics. But let's first of all see some of his, uh, some of his uh, accomplishments. So double degrees in med tech and med tech quality and regulatory affairs, which really is very, very important, critical in any uh, branch of medical profession. He is a certified project management professional, PMP, uh, and holds product owner Scrum Master certification. He also holds Syscom, certified in supply chain and operational management from Brassi. He has a strong focus on design and implementation of processes related to medical devices, including software and e-health. He's a very hands-on person, very practical that I know personally. Currently working on the development of soft mist inhalers and nose-to-brain drug delivery products. Very sensitive, very state-of-the-art, cutting-edge technology. Uh, specializing in drug device combinations, and he has, to his credit, implementation of ISO 13485 medical device QMS. So you can imagine how much he is into the technological uh, field, very hands-on, very practical, and he has so many credentials to his. It's, it's difficult to put all, everything on, on this slide, but this just to give you a flavor of uh, his uh, stature in, in, in this field. And this is about me. Uh, I have the privilege to speak with Danish today, after Khan here, Executive Director at Brassi. So let's proceed. Yeah. So Danish, uh, thank you very much uh, for taking out the time today. I know how busy you are, but again, for the sake of our colleagues and fellow professionals, we do these interviews and we speak with industry experts and professionals to you know gain some insight uh, of what they do and how it relates to supply chain management. That's our, our focus. And of course, you know, you are certified yourself. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, it's uh, an honor for me to uh, to be invited as a professional for uh, the med medical device industry. And um, yeah. I don't consider that supply chain is 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 uh, there is no um, overlap between supply chain or any in the, in the industry, especially in med tech. Um, it's all about um, supplies. I would say I will I will come to this point when we talk about different uh, topics or we, yeah. we go through in our interview. But it is really imperative that um, they are not uh, they are quite related to each other yeah they're, they're yeah. In, in, intertwined absolutely uh, as obvious from your, your articles that you have a deep insight into supply chain to, uh, methodology processes concepts how the supply chain operates and with your deep knowledge into engineering and technology of course they, they go hand in hand together exactly yeah so again thanks and let's just start uh, <laughs> picking your brain uh, danish so i would like to know with your background in med tech and quality and regulatory affairs all the, together. Can you explain the significance of regulatory compliance in the development of uh, medical devices, particularly in relation to ISO 13485? So um, as we already know that um, most of the industries with the time, passage of time, they're getting more regulated. 
if we talk about automotive or, or, or aerospace, they are traditionally quite regulated. We already know that uh, from all the lawsuits and everything going around, it's very common that we know they are regulated, um, the state governments or they uh, they give very uh, strong focus on um on those uh, regulatory aspects of it and every company producing cars or whatsoever um aerospace aeroplanes they there are some standards um uh, fortunately or unfortunately medtech is not an exception because any regulatory burden will will make the medical device very expensive. So if you talk about cars, fine, it's not a luxury, but uh, still it's, um, um, you can have more expensive cars, which are probably more advanced cars. The regulatory hurdle is even more expensive. Like if you talk about AI driven cars, right. then it's regulated more, there are more tough regulations, right. tougher regulations for those. Um, Unfortunately, medical device uh, is also quite regulated. Uh, on one side, it is unfortunate for, because it, it increased the cost of the device. So you need to have regular audits, you need to have regular um, certifications to produce the device. But I would say it is also very important to have such regulation. Otherwise, you have unsafe devices in the market. So anybody can produce something or anybody can design any, anything, but they have no um, regulatory or quality controls. So you have something which is not reliable, probably not safe. Yeah. So um, it, it's like um, two sides of the coin, yeah? You yeah. see that? If I'm into that, I mean, that's a great example. Yeah. of automobile like there you have a choice luxury versus routine regular cars you pick and choose how much regular compliance you're exposed to in medical devices there's no such choice it's human body yeah. same as one standard right <laughs> so yeah. you just can't yeah. take any there's no second second uh, tier or second level so you, you have to be absolutely 100 percent safe and compliant i fully get that yep so if you talk about um, ISO 13485, that's a um, de facto standard for medical devices. Even it has a focus on medical software as well. There are some add-on standards for medical software, but in general, like uh, for a specific um, IEC 62304, it's for medical software. But in general, ISO 13485 is uh, mandatory for every medical device company. Even for medical software companies, they have to be partially compliant. Mm -hmm. um, he is very much comparable to uh, ISO 9001. So if you compare chapter by chapter, you can you can see some sort of relationship. So if if your company is already familiar with ISO 9001, if you have experts in ISO 9001, you can actually um, use those expertise to get your um, ISO 13485 compliance. It's it. not... Yeah, so okay. it's not uh, out of the world. It is something which is based on already existing. There are many companies who have experience in uh, ISO 9001, and you they can actually carry on this experience, use that experience, and get the ISO 13485 um, certification as well. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, in the US, uh, there were the 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 quality um, the FDA quality related um, regulations for medical devices. They were not uh, pretty much aligned with um, ISO 13485 in contrast oh, okay. to you. But now they are they have updated recently. Okay. Just recently this year. And uh -huh. that they will be more aligned to ISO 13485. So in the whole world, so ISO um, 13485 will be the de facto standard for US, UK. So once you are um, ISO 13485, actually there is very much... Um, aligned um, regulatory program or the certification program you have seen it you, um, you, you you may have only once in a year audit and you are um, audited by single body from the us and you are certified to iso 13045 for almost all of the world wow. us eu and the countries who are the signatory like japan and so on mm. so this is i would say 
U.S. is far ahead. Europe has not taken this path, but U.S. is far ahead that they have offered this program. So, um, I mean, once you are in the, into this, there are many, many ways that you can um, optimize your cost. Once you are invited, to, I mean, there is no roadblock, I would say. That's my conclusion on it. There is a journey in the beginning, but um, hmm. it's very positive. Like, uh, And we are going in a right direction. Okay. Uh, in, in the, if you talk about U.S., they are going in the right direction. We have some hurdles in the EU that our digitalization system is not so far as the U.S., Okay. So US is managing all the um, adverse events, databases, and so on. FDA is already maintaining it. Wow. Uh, but it's not like in Europe. They are just catching up. And um, probably in the next five years, we will have more synchronized databases or global databases where you can see the adverse events and see what's going good, what's not doing good. And so on. Oh, that's great. Uh, so first of all, just let me try to understand the like you said, the ISO standard, uh, the 9001 provides the framework. And if you are going to implement the 13485, it is specialization or branching the concept and the overall tier is the mm -hmm. same. So if a company has already implemented 9001, and they're going to do medical devices, they can utilize the same framework. And Add add this uh, specialization add to that. That's great that's to know. Possible. Yeah. I think that possible. That will that will be easy for them if they already have a one quality management system. It will be easy for them to get the ISO thirteen four eight five. Um, however, I um, ISO thirteen four eight five is still it's not very prescriptive. It gives mm. you things to your imagination how you set up your processes. It's not okay. very prescript prescriptive standard. But it is also good for many companies. If it's not prescriptive, you can define on the size of your product uh, or your company, the nature of your product, how um, deep you enforce those, how strict you enforce those controls. One thing is really important for such standards. It gives a lot of, um, uh, or it imposes a lot of responsibility on the top management right. uh, to be quality aware. Right, right. It it leaves a room for you to adapt to what you need, not yeah. being strictly prescriptive. Uh, that's like, in a sense, it is it's, it's, it provides you with the flexibility and your own intuition. How do you want to use these standards? Yeah, but on the other side, it gives a lot of responsibility to the uh, yes. company. Of the yes, company. The, yes. Like they didn't have to meet uh, at least once in a year, uh, discuss the quality uh, topics or probably like in my company, we meet every three months, see what what are the problems in the company, quality related right. problems, and in general resources problems. So it, it looks very, um, you know, if you talk about a quality management system, um, you, you think that it has no overlap with the business activity, but it does have like- <laughs> I would say uh, it has a huge impact. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for example, if if you don't if you have lack of resources, you are not managed to you're not managing to to have certain controls because you have lack of resources because there is a, a specific topic dedicated for resource management yes. that you, you have if you want to implement quality, you need to sure to uh, you need to ensure that the top management provides you resources to in, uh, to enable a company meet their quality policy or quality objectives. Um, in your in your field, I'm sorry. In your field, this is the top priorities. The quality is, and uh, no no compromise there. Absolutely right. No compromise. Um, yeah. One more thing, if you um, if you just connect it to the uh, to the supply chain. So it's it's, it's great to know, Danish, that uh, on one hand, ISO provides a very nice framework, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, very heartening to know that the standardization across the globe. Uh, U.S., EU, and other areas are kind of expected to converge to a single standard and uniform standard uh, in the coming years. That's great. Yeah, I'm happy because it, it will um, it will uh, lighten the burden on the on the industry because yes, it, yes, if they are developing for one one uh, geographical location. Uh, cost wise, you. yes, yes, cost, the cost will come differently. That's about the complexity in supply chains. The more variety you have. There may be complexity for by design. You cannot remove all complexity because there are some technical requirements. However, 
if you can have common standards, it will definitely bring down the cost and remove complexity to a great extent. Exactly. So if we just, um, not to forget about one implication of this standard, which is also very important in, um, in connection to the supply chain management, that the standard actually uh, um, mandates um, all the med medical devices manufacturers to have sort of traceability in the products. Absolutely. Uh, yes. I mean, supply chain is not only about from where it originates or it, it is just delivered. And the story actually begins from there for a medical device. Serialization so, and all the serial numbers to, yes. to the last uh, part of consumption. That's and the you, key. Yeah. Case, yeah. So if something goes wrong in the field, uh, as I just discussed about adverse events and so on, you should be able to trace back yes. that when, it, when that specific device was manufactured, in which lot whatsoever. So it's uh, somehow related to the um, reverse logistics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely and it is. So it's yeah. not that we just deliver the device, we just forget about it. No, nope. that's not the case. And now something uh, went wrong in the yep. field. And was ever tracing back to the origin, and so they can do the root cause analysis and fix it for the future. That's the whole idea. Continuous, the whole continuous idea. improvement. Yeah, that's the that's the whole idea, and um, there is a whole um, chapter chapter dedicated for traceability and supplier evaluation. You cannot have any you cannot have any supplier. You need to have the supplier rating, grading, yeah. whatsoever. You need to have regular audits of the supplier. So it's a huge quality and regulatory burden on the on the. So and if it's aligned worldwide in US and UK in US, UK and Europe, yes, then it is it is very nice uh, approach. Yeah, and that will bring full transparency. Yeah, right? it's more across the supply chains. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. That that's great. Uh, very very enlightening uh, review of uh, ISO how to operate and uh, what's the future ahead of us. Uh, on your other uh, hat that you wear <laughs> as a project management professional, I would like to kind of dwell a little bit uh, into that. How do you integrate your knowledge and especially in agile methodologies, just such as Scrum, into the development process of medical devices that you do all the time? And what advantages does the knowledge bring to you? Yeah, that's that's very interesting question and um, one of my favorite as well because um, topic agile is one of my favorite topics. Um, theoretically, or um, theory, if you if you think uh, more uh, from the theoretical perspective and go back to um, in the nineties, especially in nineteen ninety seven, FDA had uh, actually a publication on the medical device design controls. Wow. And everybody, everyone who is new to the industry, he get a flavor of design controls, a so-called V model. That okay. if you have uh, on one side of the V, you have um, the design inputs on the other side of the verification validation of the design inputs, a so-called V model, which is actually very primitive waterfall model based on a waterfall model okay. uh, uh, of development. Um, uh, still, it is being taught if you uh, start a new job in a medical device, you don't learn it normally in the in the university, but once you get into med, med tech, you learn it. We have a um, V model, we have to um, uh, define the user requirements or customer requirements. From there, you have system requirements and goes to um, further deep in the unit or, or the subsystem requirements. And at uh, on the other side of the V, you have to verify all those requirements. And at the end of the day, you have to validate it in a mm -hmm. more user environment. Like if it's, a, um, I would say, X-ray equipment, for example. Okay, like a pilot or a, or a prototype. You verify, everything, you verify yeah, okay. everything, all the requirements. Mm -hmm. But then you have to take this to in the field and, and the healthcare professional has to test it. Mm -hmm. And then you validate it. Uh, it's sort of like human factory studies. It's also okay. Mandated. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure if how how regulated is the automotive that you have to do home and factors, but for medical device is a must. There is a whole uh, there is a standard for it six two three six six. Only for human factors studies in the med tech. Mm -hmm. So I mean it's very regulated. So you have a yeah. dedicated risk management a standard for medical. Mm -hmm. 
risk management. We have a dedicated standard for usability in the medtech. Yeah. I mean, everything is very, very much specific to it. Yeah. Um, fortunately, um, the thing has um, has changed a lot since we had this uh, design control guidance from the FDA. In okay. 1991. Everybody has adapted it. It is well accepted in the industry if it's US or it's EU. But um, um, as we progressed uh, in the Scrum or, or the Agile world, mm. There are some ways where we can implement um, not 100%. Actually, you cannot implement um, the way you implement in an industry is the agile methodology. You need to be somewhere in between, between the classical um, model hmm. um, model or and, and, and the classical uh, agile model, somewhere right. in the between. You can still, there is a... Um, um, a guidance, a TRI, TIR 45 for okay. um, agile medical device software. Okay. It's dedicated to, mm. um, also a, a ISO guidance, dedicated for medical device software okay. or medical software. Um, the, um, the catch here is that you cannot, um, you cannot completely uh, develop your device agile but you can still take out some future set. Okay. You can split your your medical device. Let's suppose you have a extra machine. You can divide it into subsystems. Okay. There is a there is a branch of engineering called system engineering where yep. you can de define your device as a complete system. Yep. And you send set subsystems. Yep. They have interfaces. Uh, once you have it, it's easy to break down into subsystems and each systems have some set of features you can uh, develop these features independently of the other features mm. and test it in this um, agile cycle okay. very and validated actually for every agile cycle you have to do this v model for every agile mm -hmm. cycle wow. it's more burdens but but it it has the benefit that it it gives you um, continuous quality oversight okay yeah, this feature is developed, it is tested also, and then you like, can merge those subsystems or okay. subsystems at some point of time, right. and then you have a complete device, yeah? Yeah, better, uh, better visibility in development, and yeah. uh, similar to your WBS core model, uh, work breakdowns, uh, work exactly. structure, breakdown structure, from there exactly. you you can apply different levels of uh, waterfall, uh, and mm -hmm. we and, and we develop and and then merge them together when everything is done. You bring the components together to get the whole model, the whole system. But still, there are many many companies who are you know, who are sticking to waterfall at this uh, stage gating process. Yeah. Like uh, this is well proven for Metech. It it is um, industry standard. Um, luckily, <laughs> I would say FDA um, is not saying that you have to have this model or other model. Otherwise. Yeah. Again, a regulatory burden to do it agile. In right. some aspects, agile is good for medical device. In some aspects, mm -hmm. you have to do this V model uh, verification for yeah. every each and every future. Um, even if you have like, if you are developing a, a, a small software feature and you have to do all this V and V again multiple times. Okay. Be very very much time consuming. Mm -hmm. There are many companies I work with um, with an. Um, as an external with a company who's developing glucose, closed loop glucose monitoring system with insulin pump. Mm. So they okay. are actually developing agile, but as sort of um, uh, not completely agile, I would mm. say. Something yeah. in between because completely agile is uh, not possible in meta. You have yeah, I mean, it all depends on the environment and the results. If you can achieve the results with combination of uh, agile and 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 conventional, yeah. why not? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. like you said, FDA looks and leaves it to you to choose the tools and the means as long as the result and the compliance is being met. Exactly, you yeah. have to have the complete traceability of all the yes. requirements right. against uh, test cases. That's that's the yeah. crux of the V model. Yeah, and like you said, sometimes they can be prescriptive. Sometimes they can be, you know, uh, suggestive. You, you can. You, can choose your own tools, but this is the end result. We must meet that safety standard exactly. 
Kan? They look into the end results. Yeah. They look into the results. Yeah. Sometimes, um, sometimes they might go because they 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 are different standards for for every, each and every aspect. Like for human factor, there is a standard for risk management. They might go into that as well. Yeah, depending on 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 the so sometimes the means is also important. Yeah. Uh, as important as as, as the ends, <laughs> so to say. So that, that that brings me to my next question. So you are currently focused on the development of uh, uh, soft mist inhalers, which is a very sensitive product, and uh, drug delivery products. Can you share some of your unique challenges that you have faced in developing these innovative drug device combinations so um yeah definitely um drug device combination or where you have a drug delivery a part of it uh, a standard device is very much limited to um just you have a device you uh, validate it uh, you use it Let, let's suppose if it's an extra machine or whatsoever mm -hmm. uh, it is it is quite simple because you you don't have the drug part but in terms of quality and regulatory, it gets really messy and complicated if you have a drug device combination yes. product. So um, if you have a simple um, angiography, which is a simple stent without any drug, it is a whole different story. If you have a drug eluting um, stent, which is a drug on it, it is. It has an added benefit, definitely, but it has it in, in, uh, introduces uh, more complexity into the quality as well as the regulatory approval of the device. Absolutely. Yeah. Same goes for the inhalation products. So if we if we have, we have an inhaler, if you use this inhaler, so um, the plus point about on an inhaler, I just want to explain here what is a soft mist inhaler. It is different from a normal inhaler because it has a it has no um, gas in it. It is not a mm. pressurized container. Okay. It is. It is. It, is um, it has a high pressure. You create this high pressure using your own energy, mechanical energy. Okay. Your hand. Uh, but and this this energy uh, forces the liquid formulation uh, to come out of the pores in a in a form of a fine mist. Okay. It's, it's completely different. You kind of press it. Press. Uh, is there's no. Like there's no pressurized container. There is there's no, no nitric gas in there. It's just pure yeah. medicine, and you use it. You use exactly. air pressure. Yeah. Okay. It has a, uh, it has a better um, deposition because it's not very fast moving particles. Mm -hmm. Particles going. You control deep. the flow. Yeah. You control the flow. You control the flow, and um, and, and what's what's really important for this? What, what I want to mention here. That in comparison to the other uh, market products, it does not um, um, destroy the molecule or the particle in the drug. So very sensitive drugs like biologics uh, or any other products, mRNAs, enabled products, they could be inhaled using this device. And this is uh, the USP of this device, I would say. Wow. Okay. You can use this. Um, in in very sensitive uh, medications with very sensitive medications. Mm -hmm. Now going back to 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 the challenges which we have. First of all, the the, the foremost challenge we have it's a combination product. You have you have the um, the certification for this device. For example, for um, um, the salt solution, saline solution, mm -hmm. it is very helpful. It gives you your lungs free and so on. But if you have a client who wants to use medication A, you have to get with uh, this device with that drug, re-perform all the risk assessment with that. Right. With some of the design testing as well. So this is the challenge, the, the, the added cost. In most of the cases, it could be this burden could be uh, put on the, the client if you yeah. have any medication because the device has a dependency on the on the the viscosity of the drug. And the substance, oh, the, the yeah. leachability interaction with everything, the, 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 everything yeah. you have to perform, and the and the and the um, how stable is this? Like uh, yes. the drug stability, yep, yep. The drug is um, is it stored in this uh, in the syringe because the syringe is the reservoir for the right. device. Mm -hmm. It's closure system, mm -hmm. um, container closure system. The where the container, yep, yep. Yeah. And um, 
it needs to sometimes in some cases it needs to stay there for six months or one year yeah, before what shelf life we are determined yeah, yeah it has to... determined yeah. so all the tests needs to be repeated uh and it's a it's the it's a burden for uh for us so therefore for us it's uh, at this time it's more focused on b2b where we can do clinical studies with this device and um, to, to give a proof of concept if the drug is working in the clinical um, uh, setting environment, yeah, yeah. In the clinical environment. Um, there are some challenges like clinical trials are getting more and more expensive. It's really difficult to get. <laughs> I understand with the cost going up, everything going up. Yeah, every, yeah, everything you can imagine, going, yeah. Yeah. So, but on the other side, um, we, uh, we are still hopeful that, that this type of technology has. Um, some say in the market. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, like yeah. you mentioned, I'm sorry, like you mentioned, the USP, unique selling proposition yeah. is very important. That what, what is the unique value that you're bringing? Exactly. This combination? Yeah. That's yeah. a unique value that you don't have a gas and you don't have a powder. It's right. a liquid combination. Yeah. Uh, you have something new um, and probably safer to not to damage the... the, the yeah. yeah. And then yeah. And the less chemicals in the drug, with the drug, as a catalyst or as a as a, as an addition to more functionality just for delivery, if you don't, you need them all the better because the drug is more pure now. It doesn't have all those ingredients that are not related to the yeah. drug substance, but they are yeah. just for delivery. So it is a great, uh, great, great uh, advancement, I would say. Yeah. So if you have a like, if you have a dry powder uh, inhaler, then you have um, all of the excipients in the drug. Yeah. Yes, excipients. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and similarly, if it's um, if it's a um, pressurized container, you have other gases in that. Yes. Yep. Pressurized gases. Yes. So you just put every every add-ons on it. Yeah. Yes, yes such such a front uh, frontier uh, of of knowledge really you're dealing with. Um, from that point, I would like to see also another area of technology technology advancement, which is e-health, right? So, how do you see the e-health solutions? transforming the medical device landscape and particularly concerning the patient care and outcomes. Um, can sum up that, sum that up? Uh, maybe it's, it's a very large question, please, please, but maybe, in, in a summary, yeah. I would, yeah, yeah, I, I don't want to go very deep. I, I'll just uh, touch it here um, with some of the keywords like sense of fusion, I would say. We have a, we're talking about the sensor fusion or sensors data in the supply chain as well. So probably mm. you are aware of some of my articles as well. How many yes, sensors? absolutely. Yeah. They're very, very insightful. Your article that up here in Brazil newsletter on these topics uh, is really worth reading. Yeah, sorry. Primarily uh, the sensors we use in the medical device, mm, all the motion sensors, whatever, mobile devices and so on. You already have those sensors in, in your mobile devices or in your smart watches or whatsoever. You just need to fuse those data sets. And then uh, uh, um, using that data, you can predict if patient is about to fall, for example, in a clinical setting or non-clinical setting, you can predict it. If you have enough data, you can predict it that patient is going to fall because of this and this data sets, and you can predict it. You can optimize the clinic. I'm working on a, on a, on a paper, um, um, op to optimize the clinical trial using some data, public data, and see how you can get extracts of information, how to optimize the clinical trials. Wow. Uh, using the past data from the from the US government website, you can see which parameters you can change or which you, know, you can play around to optimize those clinical trials. Uh, but the other aspect, the patient aspect of, of such apps um, have been, um, working on similar platforms where we, um, in, in, in the past, I developed um, um, uh, all-in-one solution. We had a cl cloud platform with an app and an and inhalation device. And it was merged in a way that all the data from the inhalation, patient's inhalation data could be um, all, how fast, how slow the patient is doing his inhalation could be uh, shown in a cloud platform, you can see how patient, how good or bad is the patient is doing during the, during the clinical trials, or even outside the clinical trials that were uh, focus on clinical trials. Um, so, and you can see uh, how good or bad is the adherence to the to the regime you have right. assigned 
Okay. Can, you can you, you, you can monitor. We are not very far from techno tech, from the technology point of view. We are we, we have already achieved it. Like it is five years ago. But the problem with all these is that who is going to pay for it? How it requires some upfront investment. Once you have it, many companies are doing there. Um, I I know many companies in the US who are actually um, giving warnings to the patients if they are going near to a zone where you they have more pollens, or you are going to oh, some sort of imagine they, they 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 meshing up of 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 information and the the different uh, data that you can capture you can gather this is small yeah. device we call cell phone it's a wonder and really the wonder, we, yeah. you, you can watch you can have, you have entertainment you can watch movies you can watch uh, sports and on the scientific side this is your best friend in terms of health and monitoring it's a lot, lot, lot of people don't realize how how what the potential this device carry is like just explaining to us yes. uh, in terms of patient care and safety really exactly um, I just quote an example uh, of um, like like where we are in the in for example in the clinical trials or in the inhalation arena. Uh, we have a partner company who is who is having an app on the iPhone or whatsoever, and it can watch you while you are doing inha inhalation using a any device. If it's a tripod or uh, it, you can uh, update the algorithm, it can watch you and and, and give you. Uh, uh, and giving to you uh, and, and running some AI algorithms, visual algorithms, it can see, hey, you are doing this thing wrong and you're doing this thing uh -huh. wrong. It improves right. the patient outcomes by training it. So it's a training app. Live on hand, right? <laughs> yeah, you don't need uh, wow. some doctor uh, nearby, but it can do uh, it can do it for, and it is uh, it is um, um, a product which you can get from the doctor, paid by the insurance company in Germany. It's a, um, I would say it's approved app. Yeah, I would say. Like you said, there, there's funding involved in the beginning, but the benefits, but, but yeah, absolutely. But the, the benefits to humankind is so immense that I, I'm pretty sure that funding will be organized and uh, companies will be interested to invest because in the end of crop, they are going to benefit from the product delivery and, and its use as well. So that's how it works, you know. You see a need, you see a need, and then you develop, uh, have investment, and you present. Uh, it benefits everybody. Then oh, that's how we have all these innovations in our hands. Right? Yeah. Very good. That's great. That's wonderful journey into the scientific <laughs> field, uh, merging of advanced technologies in uh, systems, uh, software, and uh, chemistry of it and the med medicines and, and the uh, physical uh, delivery products and delivery equipment, like the devices, is, is really front end stuff. So achieving all that, uh, you must be dealing with, or at least requiring some cross-functional collaboration, right? Between uh, like a design, quality assessment, assurance, and regulatory compliance. How do you manage those very critical pieces to work together? The key is that you need to have uh, experts uh, or experts' opinion. For example, if you get a medical device, it is not only um, a piece of equipment or a piece of um, mechanical or plastic or whatsoever. Uh, you need to have an experts who can do the biocompatibility assessment. But yeah, so if you uh, if you keep a device uh, on your table and you uh, you use it now and uh, you, you use it after a couple of days or a week and you don't know how much bacteria it has uh, accumulated. Yep. The design is very important. How you design it, if it's uh, not uh, tested in a way that you know how good, how compatible is that to your mouth because you take it the inhaler you take it in the mouth you may have some particles which goes down in your throat which is which are not good for your health mm -hmm. so you need to know the source of, of that material from where it's coming which type of character chemical it's being used right so, um, irrespective of um, of uh, of the material you need to do of the some sort of uh, testing you cannot get away with uh, if it's, it's if it's a car you can put any material in your bumper or whatsoever no no one cares 
if it's uh, good to your health or bad to your health because you don't have a physical contact with right in mm -hmm. many ways you need to be very careful about these things similarly you need to take care about the supply chain what's going to happen if this material which is tested now um it's not available anymore after one year or so mm -hmm. fully understood yeah to us, this happened to us because it's a safely tested uh, it's a safe material you have a provider so you in terms of business continuity you yes. at least you have two suppliers for that critical material because it is part of the it, it is um the mouthpiece is made of this material right so, right so there's a patient risk like i said in terms of uh, contamination and all that how to protect that providing the closures and uh, providing instructions and then also supply chain risk the the sustainability your vendors where they belong where they're coming from and the full transparency and there's stability uh, to continue yeah. su supplying to you so you can continue providing to your patients. I mean, that's that's the, that's the gist of it, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So coming to supply chain, good thing you mentioned that. Uh, come A couple of closing questions, uh, but this is very important for us and as well as for you. In what way did your certification, your knowledge gain in the SISCOM program that you did a few years ago has helped in your journey, has helped you achieve this, make the achievements? Yes, so um, as you already mentioned in the beginning, my role in the company or in, in general, my role is quality and regulatory and engineering. So I also had an interface to our logistics partner uh, through our supply chain manager, and I need to understand him as well, what type of quality requirements he has, and I also do the quality audits of the supplier, a logistic partner. I need to understand how they are, how their processes are set up. Wow. Uh, we are working with a, a quite huge um, logistics partner. Um, they also have a, um, have a client which is actually for the implants, heart implants and so on. I mean, the pacemakers and so on. And I know this is one of the market leader and I, I was supposed to audit them. Without having this background knowledge, it was near to impossible to audit wow. a big partner. And I never realized it that 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 the syscom which I um I, I learned during the syscom tenure at that time actually helped me to understand a logistics partner. Wow. Okay, I have knowledge in the quality, but I don't have knowledge how a logistic partner is working. And oh yeah. yeah. That that's, that's so amazing. Like you, you mentioned there the you're not a supply chain professional. In your company, you are a specialist in uh, waste, highly front-end scientific methodologies and development and drugs and substances and uh, delivery systems connected to the EL. But you need to understand the supply chain concepts to be able to make the best use of your processes and integrate with the supply chain strategy. In the end, you have to deal, like you said, costs and efficiencies and traceability. All that is supply chain. So without supply chain knowledge, it could be a little bit challenging. But since you have supply chain knowledge as well, it makes you a better person, a better team member to coordinate and work with, with the company and get exactly. the objectives. Uh, I, I never realized it, but I realized it when I was there uh, at the audit. I said, okay, now <laughs> where to start? And I knew where to start because I know how the supply chain works. Wow. That's great. So that's a, that's a message for everybody. Hey, you don't need to be a supply chain professional by title, but it's always helpful to understand supply chain, how it works, what's the company's objectives, how these materials flow, how they get the cost accumulated through the processes, and how you work with the design and development team to better work together to understand each other's objectives. So that, that, that that's that's a great comment. Thank you so much for that. And I will uh, I, I think we're running out of time because it's such an interesting discussion. I would love to continue forever with you, Danish. But we have to respect time as well. So here's my last question. Looking ahead, what trends you foresee in the med tech industry? You are a specialist in that area, especially concerning supply chain management and the development of combination products. How should companies prepare to adopt to these trends? And you're already looking at the future, like you just mentioned a few minutes ago. So please. Yeah, I think important important aspect of it is that we have a lot of data. Uh, okay. Everywhere data is the key. So there's a lot of data coming from everywhere. How to probably you pro probably use that data for the benefit of the industry. 
uh, in this case, med tech and supply chain, you have a lot of data, you have a lot of signals coming, how to use that data, uh, so called AI. Um, that's one part of it. But um, um, everyone had that focus on that side. But if if we if if you talk about drug device combination, we we are still seeing biotech is is going very fast. So we have um, uh, because as we are more on the B two B, we are in contact with many biotech companies. They are creating new um, new medications based on nanoparticles, uh, based on mRNA therapies, and so on. It's a huge new world. Uh, yes. uh, it's coming ahead of us Indeed. Just, uh, yeah and uh, fortunately we are at the forefront we our, our device is one of the candidate which you can use it and um, political landscape definitely is changing a lot you have different things going on in the world many people are talking about uh, the wars here or there mm. it has an impact on every industry including supply chain and medtech What's going to happen if you have uh, some specific polymer coming from a specific location in the world right. and it's not coming anymore? What's wh what are you doing? Yes, uh, the sourcing, titanium, right? Titanium. Sourcing in risk, many yeah. Plants, in many implants in Medtech, you use titanium. If mm -hmm. it's coming from part of the world, somewhere in Africa or whatever, and yeah. you have a war going on there, what's going to happen? So it's a very volatile world. And it is. The, so you you cannot say that and and as you said already that um you need material for every industry if it's automotive or medtech and for medtech if you don't have the um, the contingency plans we talk about in supply and content contingency plans what's going to happen if if a specific material is not coming and you need it urgently yes, for that yes and how, test yeah. Yeah. how do you maintain your critical sourcing those things are that that you yes. cannot get from anywhere. You plastic containers you can get molded from maybe multiple places, but the key ingredient, uh, the active ingredient in your in your drugs product, that's, such a, such a, I mean, that's not you can shop anywhere. So that's the very important question about sustainability and risk management. And see, on one hand, you mentioned the the potential risk coming out of these disputes and conflicts and climate changes and all that. But also look at the other side of it. The need is going to expand because for the same reason, the pollution, see, smog, mm -hmm. uh, who knows what kind of new uh, challenges to health, to the public it brings and what new developments you will need to come up with to counter those challenges and maintain public health and what kind of drug substances will be developed and you need containers for those. So it's both sides, the inbound side, the sourcing and also the need side how is it going to evolve in the coming days and, and, uh, and years? Right. That's, that's true. The Last week I was uh, invited at a um, couple of weeks ago, I was in the lung conference, uh, conference in Munich, okay. and they were discussing that how the pollution is not in, a, uh, not in Europe as such, in, 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 in where we are, we're based in, but in general it is causing um, a lot of health issues in many Asian countries because yep. they are growing like hell. I mean, industry is going very yeah. good, yeah. but there's a downside to Downside, yeah. yeah. Everything has uh, two sides to it, industry productivity, sourcing, uh, manufacturing, it, or you, you need all of that, but how do you do that? In what fashion, in what form? Uh, what are the controls in those countries? And every country, I would say, that kind of controls that keeps a cap on pollution and contamination. So there you go, absolutely. Great discussion, uh, Danish. Really, I appreciate your time. And uh, it's always good to see you as a colleague, but uh, for our people, our team members and our uh, students, alumni, and generally our peers in the industry, uh, it's great insight into what you do, how impactful it is to our own health. Everybody is impacted. Our relatives, our elders and kids, they all use uh, some kind of medical devices, especially as you grow in your age and you need those inhalers, uh, how it is manufactured, what safety precautions are being taken. is very, very good to know that there is so much being done in terms of safety and uh, safety and, and efficacy that you guys take care of. Mm -hmm. So 
we will have this, uh, we'll share this with our colleagues and uh, different media platforms. And I'm sure that we'll learn a lot from this. So thank you again, Danish. And I will say goodbye to everybody on this uh, note. And we'll look forward to see you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.